Mrs. Roberts is a 50-year-old retired teacher who lives with her husband and pet dog. Over the past five years, Mrs. Roberts has noticed that the painless swelling on the left side of her face has slowly increased in size. As it has never caused her any pain before, Mrs. Roberts had not consulted her GP sooner. Recently, she's begun to notice marked asymmetry in her face and decides to make an appointment with her GP. The GP palpates a hard mass extending from the inferior border of the zygomatic arch and organises an urgent CT scan. This reveals a 3 by 3 cm pleomorphic adenoma of the parotid gland. Six weeks later, Mrs. Roberts undergoes a superficial parotidectomy to excise the tumour and is currently recovering at home. My name's Aisha and in today's tutorial, we'll cover everything you need to know about the parotid gland, its close anatomical relations and neurovascular supply. We'll then return back to the case and discuss some of the surgical considerations involved in performing a superficial parotidectomy. The three salivary glands of the head and neck include the submandibular gland, the sublingual gland and finally the parotid gland. The parotid gland is the largest salivary gland and is responsible for approximately 30% of our total saliva production. Unlike other salivary glands, it produces purely serous secretions in adults and is enclosed in a tough fibrous capsule. The parotid glands lie on either side of the buccal and parotid regions of the face and are situated anterior to the lower half of the external ears. If we remove the right parotid gland and the abicularis oculi muscle, we can see the masseter muscle lies immediately deep to the parotid gland. In terms of its size, the parotid gland typically extends from the zygomatic arch to the inferior border of the mandible. If we now view the head and neck from a lateral view, the parotid gland covers part of the anterior aspect of the sternocleidomastoid muscle and extends anteriorly to cover approximately halfway across the masseter muscle. Importantly, the parotid duct is responsible for carrying secretions produced by the parotid gland to the oral cavity. The parotid duct emerges from the anterior edge of the parotid gland and crosses the face transversely to pierce the buccinator muscle where it opens into the oral cavity at the second upper molar. Before we take a closer look at the anatomical relations of the parotid gland, it's important to know that accessory parotid glands are relatively common and are seen in approximately 20% of the general population. Accessory parotid glands are considered separate but in close proximity to the main parotid gland and can be located on the superior aspect of the parotid duct or on the lateral aspect of the masseter muscle. The external carotid artery enters the deep and inferior border of the parotid gland where it gives off several branches. The main terminal branches of the external carotid artery which arise within the parotid gland include the maxillary artery which passes horizontally and deep to the neck of the mandible and the superficial temporal artery which continues superiorly to supply the temporal regions of the face and scalp. If we consider the veins, the superficial temporal vein and maxillary vein pass inferiorly to converge to form the retromandibular vein on the inferior aspect of the parotid gland. Once leaving the inferior border of the parotid gland, the retromandibular vein divides into an anterior branch which drains into the internal jugular vein and a posterior branch which drains into the external jugular vein. Let's now finish off by considering the course of the facial nerve in relation to the parotid gland. The facial nerve leaves the skull through the stylomastoid foramen. As its name suggests, this is located between the styloid and mastoid processes of the temporal bone and marks the termination of the facial canal. Immediately after leaving the stylomastoid foramen, the facial nerve gives off three extracranial branches. These are the posterior auricular nerve, which supplies the auricular and occipital frontalis muscles, the nerve to supply the posterior belly of digastric, and the nerve to supply the stylohyoid muscle. The facial nerve then descends inferiorly to penetrate the space between the superficial and deep lobes of the parotid gland. There it divides into a superior temporal facial branch and an inferior cervical facial branch, where it gives off five terminal branches of the facial nerve. Starting superiorly, these include the temporal branch, the zygomatic branch, the buccal branch, the marginal mandibular branch, and finally, the cervical branch of the facial nerve. 
These nerves are essential in providing motor innovation to the muscles of facial expression. Whilst the facial nerve passes through the parotid gland, it's really important to remember that the facial nerve does not provide intrinsic innovation to the parotid gland. Instead, sensory innovation to the gland and overlying fascia is provided by the auricular temporal nerves and greater auricular nerve. Secretor motor fibers are supplied by parasympathetic nerve fibers, which work to increase saliva production. Preganglionic parasympathetic fibers begin with the glossopharyngeal nerve, where it then synapses at the otic ganglion. Postganglionic parasympathetic fibers then travel alongside the auricular temporal nerve to reach the parotid gland. Finally, sympathetic supply of the parotid gland originates from the superior cervical ganglion and acts to inhibit saliva production. Okay, let's go back to Mrs. Roberts who developed a 3 by 3 cm tumour of the parotid gland. Pleomorphic adenomas are the most common form of benign mixed tumours and comprise around two-thirds of all salivary gland neoplasms. Like in Mrs. Roberts' case, these tumours commonly present as well-circumscribed rounded masses within the parotid gland and have a higher incidence in females than males. Patients initially present with either a lump or enlarging mass, which is often painless. As this continues to expand, it can infiltrate nearby vessels and tissues, causing erythema or even hemorrhage. As pleomorphic adenomas commonly affect the superficial lobes of the parotid gland, a surgical procedure known as a superficial parotidectomy can be performed to surgically excise the parotid tumour. Due to the delicate and fragile nature of the facial nerve within this region, it's vital that branches of the facial nerve are not accidentally injured during surgery. Post-operative complications of a parotidectomy include temporary or permanent facial nerve palsy, infection or Frey syndrome as a result of injury to the auricular temporal nerve. This condition causes increased sweating and facial flushing whilst eating and is otherwise known as gustatory sweating. And there we go, we've covered the anatomical relations of the parotid gland, its neurovascular supply and have discussed the surgical implications of performing a parotidectomy. If you've enjoyed this session, remember to give this video a like and subscribe to our channel and leave a comment down below with what you'd like to see us cover next. Thank you for listening and have a great day.